What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so we are continuing on with Earth X. And again, I, God, I love this story so much. We're about halfway through right now. Um, by the time we end this video, we'll be about a little over halfway through. Um, this is such a cool story. I, I love Earth X so much because it's, it's interesting. I'm still debating on whether or not I'm going to do Universe X and Paradise X. I'm still not 100% sure yet. But what we do in this video is we initially pick up with the origin of the Incredible Hulk in Earth X. And for the most part, this origin story is almost identical to the origin that exists inside Marvel Comics with one major difference. Now, of course, the, the whole idea of like Bruce Banner having been a genius and then going on to basically develop the Gamma Bomb, that's all still intact. The difference here is that in Marvel, in the main Marvel continuity, the idea was that Bruce Banner had these different forms of the Hulk, quote unquote, because they represented different facets of his personality. You had like Joe Fixit, who was the mobster Hulk. You had like Devil Hulk, different things like that. In Earth X, that's not the case. Instead, they're just evolutions of the same being. The idea is that inside of Bruce Banner is this gamma radiation that's constantly growing and constantly expanding. What the gamma radiation is trying to do is leave the body of Bruce Banner and manifest itself physically. And that's what takes place. What ends up happening here is Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk basically split. And that's why you have two distinctly different people here. You have Bruce Banner and then you have the Incredible Hulk. Again, the caveat to all this is that Bruce Banner sees through the eyes of the Incredible Hulk. Now, again, this all ties into the ongoing events of what's taking place with regards to Banner and Clea and so on. But before we jump back into that, I do want to to kind of pick up with this next little transition, which deals with Reed Richards looking for Cerebro. Now, again, Cerebro, of course, is the helmet used by Charles Xavier that was designed for the purpose of locating mutants. But because the X-Men have been defunct for really a number of years, and because Xavier himself is basically dead, what this means is that the Cerebro helmet's just kind of been out there. Now, under normal circumstances, the helmet can only be used by those who have telepathic powers. Reed Richards doesn't have those. And so the question is, how's he going to be able to pull this off? Now, what he does is he actually goes to see Ben Grimm. And the reason for this is because Ben Grimm basically has uh, within his, I guess really, really within like a place that Reed had built for him, these various schematics of Charles Xavier's brain. And Reed Richards is looking for this because what he can do is basically, quote unquote, modify his own brain to basically match that of Charles Xavier and kind of give off this perception that he has telepathy. Now, this is really just kind of things going fast and loose with regards to like Reed Richards' powers. I mean, Reed, Reed Richards doesn't really have telepathy, but the idea was that he could basically kind of trick Cerebro into believing that he does. And so we just kind of have to roll with it. <laughs> We just kind of have to roll with it for what it is. But before we find out the conclusion that he comes to, which is a pretty major one, what we end up doing is jumping directly back to the Incredible Hulk and Clea. Now remember, Clea is the niece of Dormammu, but in Marvel Comics, she was basically the apprentice and really the lover of Doctor Strange for quite some time. The difference here is that in the Earth X line of comics, Doctor Strange's spiritual essence is basically dead and his body's just there, or at least it's believed his spiritual essence is dead and his body's just kind of sitting there. At the same time, Bruce Banner had a dream that came from Captain Marvel that the world was going to end. And so that's why they're traveling into the realm of Mistress Death. Again, if you want to know that, uh, know more about that in a little more detail, the last video will flesh all that stuff out. But they're basically going into the realm of Mistress Death to find Marvel and ask him the question, why did you appear to me in a dream? And why are you telling me the world is ending? And so once the Incredible Hulk goes into the realm of Mistress Death as a tether of sorts, what this means is it allows us to basically see what goes on inside this world. And this is kind of ironic because in the land of the dead, the heroes who are there don't know they're dead. Instead, they're still continuing on to fight like they always did. Now notice this, it's not a comic book fight the way we would expect it, which is to say like the X-Men fighting an X-Men villain and the Fantastic Four fighting a Fantastic Four villain, or at least what's left of the Fantastic Four. It's just heroes fighting bad guys. And so they're just kind of caught in this eternal struggle of good guys versus bad guys. And this is what they do. But because of the fact that the heroes don't know they're dead, they're just continuing on the same way they always did. And it's kind of cool to see these small little things here and there. You know, for example, uh, Susan Storm and Johnny Storm are looking for Reed Richards and Ben Grimm because they don't know they're dead. Now, ultimately we end up having the incredible Hulk in his search for Marvel, who basically travels to the realm of uh, Doctor Strange in this kind of land of the dead version of New York, and then comes across the spirit, the, the essence of Doctor Strange, which is passed on to the dead. And Doctor Strange simply just says, hey, look, there's a lot going on here that you don't know about. I don't have time to tell you everything. But the person that you see is Loki. The individual that you would call Loki is not as devious as you believe he is. Instead, like, he's going to be one of the people who's supposed to help things. The problem with this is he's allied himself with someone evil. But before the Incredible Hulk 
can find out what it is, we basically end up just sort of, uh, of, of transitioning back to Bruce Banner. And this is when we start to go through everything that's going on, because what ends up taking place is uh, Bruce Banner really kind of calls out and says, hey, look, things are getting kind of hairy in here. Ultimately, like Thor jumps in. Now, it's really Bruce Banner putting on a ruse, right? I mean, Doctor Strange tells the Incredible Hulk, really tells Banner through the eyes of the Hulk, do not tell anyone that you're talking to me right now. No one can know you're talking to me. And the reason for this is because the death of Doctor Strange came at the hands of Clea. She killed her own master. She basically destroyed his spiritual essence. And the reason for this is because she turned her back on Doctor Strange and allied herself with Loki. So like, it's pretty intense and pretty hardcore and it is pretty interesting. But what we end up doing at this point is jumping directly to, to Captain America. Because again, inside the city of Los Angeles, you basically had a young kid called the Skull. And this kid essentially had the power to dominate the minds of others, cast illusions, different things like that, basically bend them to his whim. And the result is that he's been mass, uh, you know, been amassing an army that's about 10,000 strong. And where Captain America had sent out these few mutants that he discovered here and there to basically go receive training from uh, from Cyclops, they've been banding together and Captain America's basically been building an army under the auspices that when you end up having the scroll and his forces who show up in New York, that uh, Captain America is going to be able to take them on with his own gathering of sorts. Now, one thing to bear in mind here, it's not like the skull is showing up to New York with an army of like 10,000 superpowered people. It's not really like that. Instead, it's just an army of 10,000 people. And so there are a lot of superpowered beings there, but just because people have powers doesn't mean they have even powers. So really, the scales could kind of go either way. The benefit for the for the skull is that at the end of the day, the good guys will try not to hurt innocent people. And that's where the villains will ultimately end up coming out on top in the various skirmishes and the conflicts that we've seen over the course of Marvel Comics history. Now, at this point, we jump directly to the origin of Peter Parker Spider-Man. And again, this origin falls very much in line in the same way. It starts to give us this origin of Peter Parker, who gained his powers from a radioactive spider bite. Ultimately, he fell in love with, uh, with, with Gwen Stacy. Uncle Ben died. Peter Parker had his whole history. Gwen Stacy eventually died in the night Gwen Stacy died storyline. Uh, and then, of course, he goes on to marry Mary Jane Watson. Now, basically, of course, their whole situation comes to an end. But it also hits on things like Peter Parker getting the Venom symbiote during the original Secret Wars from 1984. And that explains how the Venom symbiote is here on Earth. So again, all these histories are still pretty much the exact same. The difference is that in this story, we end up basically picking up with John Jameson showing up to the two people who have been analyzing this the entire time. Now, that's why I wanted to kind of hold off and basically offer this explanation on who these guys are. What we have here is essentially Uatu the Watcher and Machine Man. Now, Machine Man made his debut back in 1977 with 2001 A Space Odyssey issue number eight. And that was actually a line of comics, if I remember correctly. And God, I'm, that's one of those like really obscure line of comics. That's one of those concepts that I believe was like thought up and it was written and drawn by Jack Kirby. It was like his own solo thing outside of like the influence of Stan Lee or anybody else. But when it comes to like Aaron Stack, he is the son of a guy named Dr. Abel Stack. And in issue number eight, what we found out was that there were a group of scientists who were basically trying to create super soldiers of sorts, but they were creating robots that would become soldiers. And the general gist of this was that they would in turn basically be sent out through all uh, through all of humanity and nobody would know they existed because nobody would be able to tell the difference between them and regular people. So think like Terminators, more or less. The issue with this was that about 50 of them, really there were 51 that were commissioned and the other 50 were destroyed. Uh, I guess X1 through 50 were completely annihilated by the uh, by the scientists themselves due to the fact that the robots began to display uh, traits that indicated that they were essentially going insane. Now the reason why Aaron Stack didn't go crazy is because Abel's Stack actually took him home and then treated him like a person, raised him like a human being. And by virtue of receiving this sort of extrasensory input on being perceived as a human, Aaron Stack began to perceive himself as a human. And so it was basically just taking in all this sensory information and then assimilating it into his own programming. And that's the difference between Abel Stack and the other, the other X-50 robots is the other X-50 robots didn't have human stimulus. And so when they were basically assigned the programming task of your job is to protect humanity, they wouldn't really know how to function accordingly they would just eventually start to go insane because their programming couldn't account for the orders they were given with how they reconcile those orders. And so uh, where he's really one of the more obscure characters in, in, in Marvel Comics, what ended up happening in this story is Aaron Stack was basically whisked away to the moon by Uatu the Watcher. And Uatu basically went to Aaron and said, you are going to become the new Watcher and I'm going to teach you how to be a Watcher by showing you everything that's going on on Earth. And you're going to look into the past of everything and you're going to compare it to what's going on now. And you're, you're basically going to learn to understand humanity. You're 
going to understand humanity on a much greater scale than you currently do. And so that's what's been happening. The two of them have basically been looking at everything that's been going on. And we've essentially been getting like the history of the Marvel Universe in Earth X by virtue of these two. Now, the other half of this is that as Aaron Stack had been watching everything that was going on and learning all this information, he'd been simultaneously downloading all these backlogs and all these catalogs, essentially everything Uatu the Watcher had stored, even though Uatu didn't really tell him to. So from Uatu's mindset, he was talking to a robot that had an understanding of humanity, but didn't really have a personality per se. It was basically a blank slate, but Aaron Stack is not a blank slate. He had curiosity. He has anger. He has rage. He has love and, you know, jealousy and affection and different things like that. And so the result is that he's basically learned that Uatu the Watcher is harboring a secret, that there's something going on here behind the scenes that Uatu knows about that Aaron Stack himself intends to try to end. So it's almost like all these different roads are sort of converging into the same place. Now, in the midst of all this, of course, John Jameson shows up and says, look, there's a massive ship headed this way. And like, it looks like it's powerful enough to obliterate the earth. I have no idea what this means or what it's going to do. But before we end up jumping into all that, we basically go back to what it is that's taking place on earth. And we essentially pick up with the forces of the skull showing up in New York and basically attacking everybody that they come across. Now, this is really more of like a, hey, we're here, we're conquering everything. Those who disagree will be dealt with. They'll be, you know, either they'll be brought under my control or they'll be destroyed. And then we'll just kind of expand our sphere of influence. And where Captain America shows up to the residence of Tony Stark, the argument he makes here is really, really intriguing. The idea of him showing up is saying, hey, look, man, like you're part of this just like anybody else. You have to get involved. But remember, Tony Stark is kind of removed. He's isolated from humanity. He just kind of serves the purpose of trying to keep things in order, as well as trying to make sure that like the global, the global supplies are kept in check and everything else just kind of exists out there. And so really everything outside of whatever it is that Norman Osborn cares about and whatever it is Tony Stark cares about, it's just kind of no man's land. It's just kind of like, you know, the land of do as you please. Maybe you'll survive, maybe you won't, but that's not my problem. Now, again, with the forces of New York stemming off this attack as best they can, the Skull's ability to like dominate the minds of others is seen in a multitude of ways. For example, the cops that are with, uh, with you know, Sergeant Luke Cage are forced to turn on Luke Cage, but of course, you know, Cage has unbreakable skin and so the bullets they used to try to shoot him with don't really work. Mayday Parker, the daughter of Peter Parker, who jumps into the fray. Now, here's kind of the funny thing here. Mayday Parker, again, is currently in possession of the Venom symbiote. We talked about that when it came to the whole thing. That's constantly what Peter Parker says is like, you have the Venom symbiote, you have to learn how to control yourself. But ultimately, she's kind of young and headstrong and jumping into it all. Now, we will find out there's a little more than what's going on here, but it is cool to kind of see this thing take place. Peter Parker trying to impart his pearls of wisdom onto his daughter. At the same time, we have uh, Reed Richards, who's again, continuing to analyze everything that's going on. And Reed Richards begins to come to the conclusion, or he, he begins to look around after modifying the helmet of Charles Xavier and comes to the realization, these guys, the people who are walking around Earth, they're not mutants, they're inhumans. Now, again, this story was written long before the events of, of, uh, of Infinity in Marvel Comics. So this like predates the modern day idea of the inhuman Terrigen myths spreading throughout the world. Now, how that happened is the question. The question is that if all these people are inhuman now, and if all these people derive their powers from the Terrigen myths, then who was it that spread the myths throughout the world? And that's when we start to realize the idea that like Crystal, for example, is starting to develop her inhuman powers, that these various people who are, who are here are, are manifesting their abilities and who knows what form they're going to take. But the question that's asked is, was it Maximus the Mad who set this off? You know, basically the, the insane brother of, uh, of Black Bolt. And the initial response of Medusa is that's not possible. One, his bomb was destroyed. And two, Maximus the Mad is dead. And so there's no reason to believe that he's the one responsible for all this. And so at this point, we jump back to Bruce Banner, to the Incredible Hulk. And this is cool because once we get into this situation, initially it's Clea and Loki who are kind of like, cool, the day's won. We're finished here. Like everything is fine. And then suddenly they're met with the return of the Incredible Hulk alongside Thor, who have really just kind of brought themselves back out of the realm of Mistress Death by quite literally pulling on the, the rope that they used to, to enter in the first place, kind of the tether that was offered there. But where Clea is overpowered by the forces of like Thor and the Incredible Hulk, she starts calling out for Loki, who basically bailed. And that's the crazy thing about this. Loki is never a reliable or trustworthy character in Marvel Comics. He never has been and he never will be. There's been times where he's tried to do good things, but by and large, with the exception of the most recent run by Jason Aaron, Loki has always been a deceptive character. He's always been the master of trickster and lies. And so it's cool because basically Clea got what everybody knew she was going to get, which was left hanging. And so where she basically says, look, if this is how things are going to be, then fine, I'll just destroy it all. I'll literally obliterate the earth. I'll leave and go do whatever. Thor turns around and beats her to death with a hammer. And that's the end of Clea. And so from here, we pick up with Captain America, where he actually transitions to Russia. And it's kind of interesting because when he's there, we find out this is where Colossus went to. After the, the fall of the X-Men, the death of Charles Xavier, when whoever was left as part of the X-Men team 
and disbanded, that he returned back to Russia, went back home. And he's been one of the many people who's been fighting on this front of making sure that like all the resources that are available are gathered as they need to be. And they're basically sent across the world to the places that need them. So they're kind of like this massive resource for food and supplies. The issue is that when Captain America shows up, he says, look, the skull is a kid. The skull attacking New York is a kid. I'm mustering as many forces as I can, I can conceivably do in order to try to bring as many people under my belt as I possibly can. And where Colossus says, no, Captain America again reiterates. He says, look, this is a kid. And he looks at the world through a kid's perspective. He doesn't see all the ends. He sees the world in black and white. He doesn't see all the shades of gray. It's kind of a wild scenario. In the middle of all this, the group's suddenly attacked by like Nick Fury. And what we find out is that Nick Fury's life model decoys have been routinely showing up and attacking Peter. They've been, been consistently showing up and like trying to take these guys out because their programming is basically just starting to go awry. It's, it's really, it's really cool. And it's really fascinating to show like these other parts of the world. But again, picking back up with Mayday, where she goes and basically fights Iron Maiden, who's, you know, kind of being controlled by, uh, by Red Skull, or I'm sorry, by, uh, by Skull, or at least it seems like it is. Ultimately, she's able to get the upper hand and actually able to get the defeat. She's actually able to defeat the Iron Maiden and call it a day just by kind of, you know, covering her face and webbing and essentially cutting off her oxygen supply and knocking her out accordingly. But once she shows up and goes to confront the skull, she learns the lesson that all inexperienced superheroes do. Just because you can fight a battle doesn't mean you should fight a battle. When Mayday shows up and she lands in front of the skull with the intention of taking him out, she can't move, she can't do anything. And the skull says, actually, you're in love with me and just dominates her. And that's where people begin to just kind of give up and call it a day. It's really like everything's basically lost here. And so the skull shows up to the, to the, uh, to the, really the residence of President Norman Osborn and simply says like, your reign is over. We're going to throw you out that window. You're going to die. And I'm going to become the new president of the United States. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. And yeah, I love Earth X. Love the Earth X line of stories. It's, it's so cool. But anyway, guys, we're going to bring this to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace. Thank you.